Okay. Oh, gosh, what a wonderful microphone system we have here. Only modern thing in the college. Right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to King's College London, and welcome to this particular event I have here. It's called Hearts and Minds, Perceptions of the Military Across Countries, but I notice we've actually changed the title. It's Misperceptions. Um, now, I'm as Sam Simon Wesley. I'm a professor of psychiatry here, and um, that means I am still a consultant psychiatrist. And that means if anybody's mobile goes off in the next 90 minutes, I will section you. <laughs> it is a power that I have, one of the few perks of my job. It keeps me happy. Um, oh, the other thing you may have noticed is this is going to be a very, very postmodern presentation, because if you look at the running order we have, we have uh, three people discussing the results of the study that Ipsos Mori have done. And finally, we have the person actually presenting the results. So that's how we're going to do it. They're, they have no idea what's coming next, nor do you. So we're going to play a game, and we'll see how close they all are to the real results. And then Bobby will reveal those, and we will all get prizes. OK, we won't do it that way. we will better be slightly more sensible, which means that, Bobby, you're going to start and actually present the results of the Ipsos Mori study. Fascinating though it is, news to most of us. Uh, the floor is yours, but not for too long. Thanks, Simon. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely to feel welcome. That's great. Uh, can people hear me? This microphone should be fine. Can you hear me? Anyone not hear me at the back? Uh, OK, good. Cool. So, as Simon says, I'm going to run through the results of the survey, and in, in many ways it is a unique uh, survey, we think, uh, unless people want to correct us, that it's not about perceptions of the military, it's on perceptions of the military compared with reality. And there have been a few studies on that, but I think the thing that makes it unique is that we're doing this internationally, we're doing it consistently across... Uh, this is a microphone, but it, can, can people not hear that enough? At the back, can people hear? At the back, can you, know, can you hear at the back? Can you hear Bobby? Not well enough. Not really. Why don't you... Well, you I've got a roaming mic. Well, why don't you use one of these mics, the live mics, and just move it over? No, sorry, come in there. Oh, here comes, here comes a roaming. Okay. So much for me saying how good Kings was at electronics. I don't think that will reach. Oh, it does. Look at that. There you go. How about that? Is that better? Good. Good. Okay, so in five countries, Australia, Canada, France, uh, Great Britain, and uh, the US. Uh, we did 5,000 interviews in total, so about 1,000 interviews in each of the countries. And it's very recent. We only did it at the end of April and then uh, the beginning of May. Um, and one methodological note, just quickly, it's only it's an online survey. So we just need to bear in mind that it's only really representative up to about 65 years in age, of age. So uh, just bear that in mind when you're interpreting the results. Uh, and what it shows is a whole load of misperceptions and then shifts between this mental image of uh, the armed forces as heroes, victim, uh, or villain. And that you can kind of see that throughout. We'll pick up that as a theme as we go through. Um, but in some ways, it's more accurate than I expected in some aspects of it. And we'll see some of those aspects as, as we go through. And, and part of the reason that I was uh, a bit surprised that some of the, the findings were fairly accurate is because we do a lot of these misperception surveys. And we did one uh, recently that showed just the extraordinary misperceptions that we have in the UK of different aspects of our population. So just taking a couple to give you a bit of context about how wrong people can be about things. Uh, we think that 16% of teenagers, actually teenage girls uh, more precisely, uh, give birth each year. Um, so that's one in six teenage girls give birth each year, not just uh, once during their teenage years, but each year. Anybody know what the real percentage is? Teenage girls that give birth each year? One percent. One. Yeah, it's a little bit higher than that. It's actually three percent. Three percent teenage girls give birth each year. We also think that 21% uh, of the UK population is Muslim. So we think that one in five people, uh, one in every five people in the country is Muslim. Any, anyone know what the actual is? 3%, a bit higher than that as well. So you're actually, you'd be very good at this. You'd be very good at these estimations. You're going nice and low. You would pull our averages down now. Uh, quite well. Uh, so the actual is 5%. Uh, and the, the interesting, well, maybe even de more depressing thing is we're not even the worst at this when you look internationally. When you compare it with other countries, in France they think that 31% of their population is Muslim, so they think 3 in every 10 people is Muslim when the actual is only 8. And then my favourite, probably out of all of them, is that uh, in the US they think 1 in 4 teenage girls get pregnant uh, each year. Uh, so 1 in every 4 uh, girls in a class uh, gets pregnant each year, and the actual is only 3%. So these, these misperceptions abound, and it's that context that we need to 
think about the misperceptions on this particular theme. So I'm going to pick up three themes. Uh, first of all, uh, all on spending is the first thing. So all countries overestimate the proportion of government budgets that go to the armed forces. Uh, we see that throughout. So we asked them how much out of £100 is spent, £100 or dollars or euros is spent, and the actual spend looks something like this. Uh, about 18%, so the US significantly ahead of the other countries, not too much in it uh, between the other countries, but we're actually at the bottom, uh, 5%, around 5% just over uh, spent on military here. And these are the public average estimates. Uh, so in the US, they think they actually spend 30 in every $100 on uh, the military, so massive overestimation. But the interesting thing in some ways is that the French are the most wrong, so they actually only spend 5%. Uh, not that I'm picking on the French throughout this uh, presentation. It, they, they do become a bit of a theme, as you'll see. Uh, the French, uh, tw they think 28, 28 out of every 100 euros of government spend is spent on the military. Uh, so actually, in Britain, we're one of the most, well, we are the most accurate. Uh, so we think 12% uh, is fi only 5% in practice. So we're still two and a half times out, two and a bit times out in terms of the proportions, which, if you put that into monetary values, that would be 83 billion instead of uh, 33 billion, more or less, that, that sort of level. But still, we're, we're relatively accurate compared to other uh, countries. One of, one of the interest, most interesting things that I, I've had is that many still have that image as Britain as a relatively big spender on the military. We, we try to get at that through this question, which asks uh, people to compare the spending in their country with the spending in other countries, a list of other countries. So whether those other countries spend more l about the same or less than uh, the country that we're talking about, in this case Britain. And that's the actual percentage point differences down the side. So a positive thing is those countries spend, a positive figure means that those countries spend more than us on their military. So people are pretty accurate on the obvious ones. So if you look at uh, the correct answers circled in green, uh, so pe people pretty much, much know that the US spends more than us, Russia spends more than us, Israel spends more than us proportionally, although one in ten think that we spend more than uh, the United States, for example, <laughs> on, the, on the military. Uh, and then we're pretty, we put one in at the other end slightly, which Norway, so most people think that uh, uh, the largest category think that we spend uh, less, uh, that Norway spends less than us uh, on the military, although look, it's not actually massively different. We can kind of give people the French one that they're a bit confused about whether we spend more or less because uh, it's more or less the same. So only 0.5 percentage point differences between the two so not too bad they're in the middle. But the interesting ones are Canada and Australia uh, where people think uh, that we spend proportionally more. Though. They think uh, that uh, very few people think that Canada and Australia spend more than us on uh, military uh, proportionally. Uh, but actually the biggest group is this group that thinks that they spend uh, less than us. Um, so we've still got this self-image of spending a lot. And, and interestingly, that's reflected externally as well. We see similar sort of patterns in other countries' views of our spending. We ask the same question in all the different countries, and you can see the same sort of pattern, almost identical figures, that 36% of Australians think that we spend more than them, many more than think we spend less than them. 37% of Canadians think we spend more than them. Uh, many, again, many more than think we spend uh, less than them. And then, maybe more surprising in some ways, that even 38% of Americans think we spend the same or more than them. Um, so, given that they've got, they spend over three times as much proportionally and much more in absolute terms, but still 38%, four in ten people think we, uh, in America, think we spend as much or more than them. Um, so, we've still got that image. Uh, people are more accurate on trends and recent trends in terms of numbers of armed forces personnel. So, so when you ask people, uh, thinking over the last 10 years, has it gone up or down? How much has it gone up or down? These are the, these are the averages that you get. The actual change is a decline, quite a significant decline, 19.6%. And the average guess is it was about 13%. Uh, so if you take just a simple mean across people's responses. But that, that hides a very wide variation. It's true. The biggest category is the correct one. So this has got decreases, increasing amounts of decrease going down that way, and increasing bigger increases going down that way. Uh, so the biggest single category is correct. 24% of people pick up that it's decreased by 11 to 20%. But then you've got quite big groups in the extremes in some ways. You've got 20% of people that think that it's decreased by more than 30% over that sort of period in the last 10 years. And then if you group this group together, that's another 20% who actually think the numbers have increased over this period. So you've still got this wide range of, of different groups having different perceptions of what's gone on in terms of simple things like armed forces uh, numbers. 
Uh, the second thing that I want to pick up is the theme of the significant overestimation of some negative outcomes uh, for personnel. And this is uh, one of the findings that was picked up most strongly in the write-ups of this, and particularly post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. So uh, we asked people, when we asked these questions, it was asked them to compare it in the armed forces compared with the population as a whole, whether it's more common or less common, PTSD in this case. And this is the sort of pattern that we get where 65% of people think it's not just slightly more common, they think it's much more common among the armed forces. When uh, do people know the actual answer to this, apart from the speakers, and uh, well, this audience will know anyway, generally. What's the actual answer? Come on. Same, yeah, same. So it's the same, it's actually about the same, which was slightly a surprise to me. As uh, someone hasn't studied this area, so only six percent of people get the correct impression that it's about the same. Um, although, you know, when you think about the mental image they will be having in mind of this, it's, it's worth remembering that, it's, that it is actually higher among reservists and those in combat who've experienced combat. So, it's actually you can see where the mental image may have come from for, from people, and that's actually a common perception internationally. When you look at we ask again the same questions across other countries, and it's, it's there's a, some consistency there. This is again the percentage in other countries thinking PTSD is much more common among armed forces than uh, the population at large. Uh, the US think 62%, 62% think it's much more common in the US, 59% think it in Canada, 56% uh, think it in Australia, so we're still the highest, we're still the most likely to think it's much more common in our country, even though in the US I think it is actually much more common, uh, where here it isn't. And then France is again different uh, on this uh, question, as we see over and over, and over again. And, and the theme from the French data is very much that they see it, the, the armed forces much more in line with the population. They don't see as much difference between the armed forces and the general population as a whole, which uh, we can come into discussion on reasons why that might be. Now you've got a similar pattern on suicide rate. So again, we ask people whether it's higher or lower uh, than uh, the general public. And you can see 53% of people think it's higher. Um, anyone know what the actual is? You're kind of getting the pattern here. Um, in any case, pardon, lower, yes. So it's lower, so, but only 8% of people uh, pick that out. Only 8% of people would think that suicide rates are lower in the armed forces, when actually that's the reality of it. Although, again, there's some nuance here because it is higher among 16 to 19 year old males uh, within the army, in particular, I think. And then uh, just on homelessness as well, uh, less, less uh, stark pattern, but still the same sort of picture going on. 40% uh, of people think that homelessness, as in street homelessness in, in this case, is, is higher among uh, the armed forces, uh, when actually it's about the same. So 40% think, uh, think it's higher, 32% think it's about the same. So still the largest category thinking it's worse than it actually is. But then there are some things that the public are more accurate on, some aspects of outcomes for the armed forces that they're more accurate on, or even potentially underestimate the challenges that the armed forces, armed forces personnel uh, face. So uh, we also asked about, as well as PTSD, we asked about common mental disorder or anxiety and depression, and people, the incidence of that, comparing, again, general population with uh, the armed forces. How common do you think it is in uh, armed forces compared to the general population? You get this um, kind of pattern where you've got, again, a, a definite skew towards people thinking it's more common, but the largest category is slightly com more common uh, compared to uh, much more common, when actually it's twice. We know from the work uh, that Kings have done, actually Laura's done, um, it's actually much more common. So twice, I, I would count twice the level as uh, much more common. So people even slightly underestimating the, the extent of it in there. And again, there's a very similar pattern in other countries. You see exactly the same sort of shape of distribution, except in France, um, where you've got that kind of, you've got a hump, you've got a more or less normal distribution of a hump in the middle, thinking it's about uh, the same. Uh, and then finally, just on the, the uh, issues, the challenges facing public, are also like, most likely to think that high risk drinking is slightly more common in the armed forces. So you get this sort of pattern, not dissimilar to the previous one, people down this end of uh, slightly more common. But then I, when you look at the actual figures for this, which again is King's work, um, uh, Nicola Fia and lots of colleagues, this is the actuals uh, measured in that particular study for the general population uh, versus the military. And it's actually massively massively different. So you've got 38% of males in the general population uh, subject to high risk drinking or in that, with that behaviour compared to 67% of males 
in the military, 16% of females uh, in the general public, but then nearly half of females in uh, the army. So you would definitely, well, I would definitely put that in the much more uh, common in the armed forces. So people slightly less likely to uh, have that image of it being a significant problem. Uh, so third element though is, so we can see people uh, overestimate the spend, have can see the issues, the challenges facing the armed forces, but still, after all of that, overall our views of the armed forces and soldiers are still uh, pretty positive, very positive in, in many ways. So we ask this question across all the different countries, splitting individuals from institutions in the different ways that we were looking at it. So in each of the different uh, professions that we looked at, so looking at firefighters and fire brigade uh, separately, people's views of this. And you'll see throughout these, these top uh, professions, that there's, people are more positive about individuals within the profession than the institution as a whole. So you see that with firefighters come out on top, they're the, they're the group that people are most favourable about, 57% uh, very favourable uh, about firefighters. The next group of the groups that we asked about is health services, so you've got doctors, and then in particular nurses, very uh, highly thought of as you might expect. Healthcare system does very well. We actually called it the NHS in this part of the study, so strong association with that. Uh, and it's only after that, just after the NHS healthcare system and health professionals, that soldiers and the armed forces uh, come in ahead of police women uh, and men and uh, the police force and ahead of teachers and schools. So very highly thought of. And I, I always look in these types of questions at the very favourable figure because that is uh, a, a strongly held view. And the 41% the uh, for soldiers is only just behind, is the only profession that's behind are firefighters and nurses. It's more or less the same as doctors, which is a group that we think of as uh, very well uh, thought of generally. Um, and then we went down, there was, there was other professions in the list. I'll just show you the bottom of the list. Um, uh, three professions, bottom of the list, and you can probably guess uh, what some of them are. I'll give you one. Uh, journalists. Um, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued who the 2% are that are very favourable towards journalists. I was trying to, trying to work out how many journalists there are in the population and how many family members they are. And whether if you added that all up, that would give you your 2%. So only 2% of people very favourable towards journalists. And you notice that the pattern is reversed, that uh, actually they're more, people are more positive about the institution of the media than about journalists. And that kind of sets a theme for all three of these professions at the bottom. Bankers, uh, next up, there's definitely 2% of bankers and family that make up that very favourable. And they, who, any guesses about the last, the last group? Politicians. Politicians. They, they only managed to scrape 1% of uh, people uh, very favourable about uh, politicians. Um, so finally for me, just, just to put that in context, because it is an international study, the armed forces, uh, British armed forces compared to other countries, and it, we kind of come mid-table compared to the other countries in, in this study. As we often find, always find really, the US... Uh, from the major countries comes out on top. Uh, most uh, highest level of favourability for both soldiers and the armed forces. Then you've got Australia, then you've got Great Britain, um, then Canada and then France. Again, uh, different at the uh, bottom there with uh, much less favourable views, but, but not a lot in it between us, Australia and Canada. So still that favourable view relative to other professions and uh, do very well compared to other countries as well, uh, maybe excluding the US. So that's it for me. There's, there's, more, so there's more findings in the survey uh, which we'll be releasing we can give out to people. But just to pick out a couple of themes, um, I think it's obviously what it gives is a nuanced picture of the armed forces. The hero, victim, villain that Helen and uh, others have talked about, is, it does play out in people's uh, perceptions uh, and how that compares to reality. Um, it's not really about contradictions in some ways. There's misperceptions in there, but it's not really contradictory that people have these uh, different views. It's just that the mental image that people have when you're answering these different types of questions is different. They'll be thinking of different things, and people can hold that. We know that from our wider perceptions work. But still, there are these misperceptions where people are just wrong, and it's interesting to try to understand why people are wrong on those things. And there's something very simple about it, which is the maths aspect of it. People just struggle to make estimations particularly on proportions. We know that 10% of people don't understand percentages in sort of any kind of form. Um, so that's, that's a challenge in those sort of sense. But, but there's, there's probably more interesting explanations around the more social psychology uh, aspects of it, where we do have heuristics and biases. We have sh mental shortcuts and biases in how we answer these. And an interesting one from our wider uh, work on perceptions is that people uh, can be emotionally enumerate 
in some ways. Uh, and that's from a social psychology point of view. That means that cause and effect in these overestimations are misestimations and our concern run in both directions. So we overestimate what worries us as much as we worry because we overestimate. And you can kind of see that pattern uh, come through in people's responses to this. It's things they worry about that they overestimate uh, most. But even within that then, the media, entertainment campaigns have an important role in this. Um, that's clearly, that's how most people get their information on these types of things, so it's really important that they have it. But one of, the, one of the reasons that we were most interested in doing this as an international study is to kind of counter that view that this is a British tabloid effect or a British media effect. You can see these patterns in lots of different contexts internationally, very similar sorts of patterns across different contexts. So a kind of Daily Mail effect or a British tabloid or British media approach is not uh, the explanation. of If it is around that it's much more about how we remember and process information than about what's given to us. And, and that is that we remember vivid anecdotes rather than issues of scale or incidents of particular issues. So we much, we're much more driven by remembering that particular case study or uh, incidents rather than statistics. So finally for me, it's a difficult balance to get right. So there's, there's really clear need to have emphasis on the challenges that are faced by the armed forces and ex-armed forces personnel, but uh, we need to bear in mind the image that that portrays for the rest of the profession. Because um, we know from, again, from lots of our other uh, work in this sort of area, that the problem is that misperceptions will stick. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, of course, Bobby, you did that uh, study, when was the data collection? It was a few months ago, wasn't it? No, no, end of April. End of April, yeah. end of April, so before May the 7th. Yeah. So indeed, if you did it now, you might find 100% um, of people believe that opinion pollsters are rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're a great chair, so I, I know, great. fantastic. I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> now, so next then, i just show how weird the French are. They're the only, they just don't like anything or anybody, do they? Right, Christopher, you, um, all the, I'm not going to introduce people because all of you can read and write. I'll just say that you have bios here. Christopher is our Professor of Military Sociology, the best uh, authority on this subject in Great Britain, and has also been a fantastic collaborator and friend for many, many years. Christopher. Thank you. Um, three, I've got five minutes. You I have think. got five minutes. I've got five minutes, so I better crack on with it. Um, three quick uh, comments by way of, of reply. Um, one is uh, about the distinction between empathy and sympathy. Um, empathy, to my mind, involves understanding. Sympathy, not the same as, but certainly involves support. And it's interesting from these data, I think, that Empathy, understanding, sympathy, support can vary independent of one another. I think they're not the same things and they can vary on different axes. And I think that's rather an important point. Indeed, I think support can be um, underscored by rather inaccurate knowledge. And I think some of the earlier slides are very interesting on this that sympathy and support can be underscored by inaccurate knowledge. I mean, compare, I won't repeat too much, but compare the data on um, high-risk drinking, common mental disorders, soldier unemployment and imprisonment with the data on PTSD, homelessness and suicide. And in the latter cases, the public tends to exaggerate. So my first point is we need to distinguish carefully between the degree to which the public has more or less accurate empathy and more or less accurately informed sympathy and support. They're not the same, and I think the international dimension of that is important. <clears throat> Secondly, just so the chair knows how long he's going to bang on, the second comment, I think, is public myths, are they stick. They're quite sticky, quite difficult to remove. An interesting task is whose task is it to uh, uh, challenge those myths? Um, is that um, MOD? Is that uh, individual soldiers? Is that uh, journalists? Um, KCMHR held an event on this. That's important for journalism, um, written, uh, net-based, blog-based, to be as reasonably well-informed as possible in order to challenge certain myths. 
And one of the myths, I think, and probably one of the most, uh, for me, uh, striking one, because I saw this in a museum in my local town as fact, that um, when you look at suicide in the Falklands War, people know this, I think, from the Daily Mail, but certainly ever since 2002, there's been a popular claim that more Falklands veterans have killed themselves <clears throat> since the war ended than died in action. And I talked to people in the museum, and they said, well, it must be true. It's such a, it must be true, because it's such a great point. Um, and there's something interesting about myth, that myths have to have a kind of believability. It's such an extraordinary line. It must be true. Come on, no one would just invent that, would they? Um, but of course, as you probably know, um, even though in 2002 the South Atlantic Medal Association said it was almost certain that the number of suicides exceeded the conflict death toll, the MOD's recent study um, uh, showed that, or found that, uh, 95 deaths uh, were recorded as suicides or open verdicts. And as the study uh, uh, reported, these, any, any suicide is a regrettable fact. But there's a very clear uh, disconnect between the myth and the reality of suicide in the Falklands War. And it's extraordinary how sticky journalists are. Well, I know this to be the case, because the Daily Mail said it. So they're convinced because they've been convinced by those who've been convinced by those who've been convinced in this sort of bubble. <clears throat> that shows how hard it is uh, uh, to get uh, um, challenges to those myths uh, uh, to get traction. Third point. A minute or so? Yep. <clears throat> um, I think there's some very interesting comparisons. So the third point is really just comparisons. Um, one is, and uh, Bobby mentioned this, and I think we need to really think hard about this, <clears throat> not just in the military context. There are some fascinating findings which show that when the public perceive more or less accurately, they seem, to my mind, to draw, to draw distinctions between individuals and the institutional environment in which they operate. You can have very highly, uh, uh, value, highly valued views of individuals and less uh, valuable <laughs> views of the institutions in which they inhabit. <clears throat> I think sociologically that's very interesting about people's perceptions of the capacity of institutions to deliver and the hard work that individuals working within them do. And I think that applies in the military, but not just the military environment. I think that's very striking. Um, Paul's then, so that means your time's up. No, don't. don't, don't, don't. <laughs> um, just note another comparison. Do we know why the French have got the ump? I mean, why, the, why they're different? I mean, if you look at the, 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 the favorability of soldiers, 52%, extraordinary compared with the other data. I have a thought on, uh, which I think Bobby mentioned, um, the hierarchy of soldiers relative to um, doctors, nurses, that hierarchy is quite, quite interesting. And one of the interesting things I think it shows us is that, is that institutionally the NHS is, is sacrosanct. And I think that's reflected in public perceptions. I think it's very interesting uh, that the military is just under that sacrosanct institution of the NHS. On my last point, on the US, where the findings for US soldiers in terms of favorable, it's up in the 80%. And why is that? Is that because they're just rah rah enthusiastic about soldiers? I don't think so. I think certainly over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a, in terms of our views on soldiers, we're not going to have a Vietnam, another Vietnam. It's a sort of a counter reaction against we must make sure we value our soldiers because we didn't do so after Vietnam. I think that lies behind those high figures for the US. But I throw that out as a discussion point. Thanks. Thank you. Good, you're demonstrating all the things. My favorite paper is called 10 Ways to Beat the Chairman. And there's 10 tips. One of them is to begin every sentence with last point. Very good. <laughs> OK. Laura, over to you. How many points are you going to make? I'm going to tick them off. Maybe about five. Five. OK, five. You've got one a minute. Off you go. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically really about the mental health findings and they show overall um, the, that the public think the mental health of the armed forces is worse than for the general population and that's across all disorders, so for PTSD, depression, anxiety and also for alcohol misuse. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about perceptions for each of the individual conditions but I think it's worth as well keeping in mind who the survey respondents might be thinking about. Um, 
when they're making the comparisons with the general population. So for the general population, it's likely that people would be thinking of healthy individuals who are employed in other occupations other than the military, when in fact we know that in the general population there'd be individuals who are employed and also unemployed, sorry, and also those who are out of work for ill health. So they're all more likely to have a mental health problem than people who are in employment. So it's worth thinking about um, the sort of schemas that people might use in making these judgments. Um, in terms of the perceptions that people might have about the military, then it's likely that they'll also think just about um, a male population, because it's easier to refer to sort of broader cognitive schemas than to split a population into subgroups. Um, so I'll talk a bit about PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's one of the only mental disorders when the diagnosis actually requires an individual to have experienced a particular event. So that's a traumatic event that would put someone's life at risk or someone close to their life at risk. So it's not really surprising, given that military personnel will experience traumatic events during deployment and also sometimes during training, that this is a disorder that would be most um, commonly associated with this population. Um, however, as Bobby said, we know from our work um, on PTSD that it isn't higher in the military than in the general population. Actually, it's slightly lower. Um, individuals who've deployed aren't more likely to have PTSD than those who haven't deployed. Um, and it's only those who've deployed in a combat role. So about a quarter of those who deploy have an increased risk of PTSD. Um, the picture is quite different in the US, where we know that PTSD is more common in the military <coughs> compared to the general population. And the perceptions of the survey respondents don't particularly differ across the UK and the US. So it suggests that the beliefs that people hold, they're not really specific to their home country and they, they represent more general um, views. In terms of anxiety and depression, the work that we've conducted shows that they're both more common in the armed forces compared to in the general population. And this fits with the views um, that were held by the survey respondents. Although less people thought that depression and anxiety were much more common in the armed forces compared to the general population than the number for PTSD. Um, one thing is that our work, whilst it's higher than um, the general population, our work shows that depression and anxiety may not be higher in the armed forces compared to specific other occupations, such as teachers or social workers. So it shows that responses to this kind of question are really dependent on the context of the question and also on the comparison that's made. In terms of alcohol, then the public were correct in their perceptions um, and thinking that alcohol misuse or hazardous alcohol misuse is more common in the military compared to the general population. It may be because alcohol traditionally is seen as being ingrained in the culture of the armed forces and also there has been quite a lot of recent press coverage on the problems of alcohol in the armed forces and these seem to be reflected in the judgments. So in summary, <laughs> Um, I think really these perceptions are important not only because they offer insight into the views held about the armed forces but also regarding the between country differences and whilst we know that the actual stats differ between countries, the perceptions are fairly stable across the different countries other than for France. Um, <laughs> The responses may also reflect the views of military families, of friends, of personnel, and potentially the views of armed forces personnel themselves. And so these sort of views could influence stigma, and they may impact on whether people actually go and seek help for mental health problems. Um, and personnel may be more likely to seek help for PTSD than they may be, say, um, for depression and anxiety. And we know that depression onset can also um, follow a traumatic event, just as PTSD can. Um, thinking about mental health, then the studies don't really tell us about beliefs regarding veterans and also reservists, and this would be something interesting to look into into future studies, given that we know the numbers of both of these groups are increasing in the population. Okay. okay, thank you much. And in fact, you have 30 seconds left. So you have 30 seconds more, Helen. I'll be very nice to you. Thank you, you very story. much. Indeed. I like your stories. We need more of them. Okay. <laughs>
I found the results of this, this survey really fascinating, in part from because of it reinforced some of the work that I've done before. And the survey, I think, shows <laughs> how, how, Britain has, how, how the British public hold contradictory views of the British Armed Forces and, and, and soldiers who serve. On the one hand, they remain popular and respected. On the other hand, some of the challenges, although clearly not all of them, are overestimated. And I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the reasons, some of the reasons that Bobby raised about why this might be the case. And I think, first of all, we do need to consider how the public acquire their information. And we need to remember that, actually, the British military footprint is pretty small. Most people who are responding to that survey are unlikely to actually know somebody who's serving in the armed forces. So where do they actually then form their opinions about the armed forces? They go to popular images, not just in the press, but in um, other forms of popular culture, from museums, from images presented by charities, um, from plays, from a whole range of different, different images. And these images are quite interesting. And I, I've looked at this um, um, in some detail, and I've identified that there, there are these three basic views of, of, of the soldier in particular. That's one of the hero, an image, uh, image of the soldier as hero, image of the soldier less popular as villain, and image more increasingly as a victim. Now, I would say that the, the hero image is still the dominant one. The villain image is, is, is very minor, but this, this image of the victim is rising, and that's what I'm quite interested in, and I'm interested in how this, how this survey reflects that. So we've got the dominant hero image reflected by that 72% of respondents who say they have a favourable, favourable view of soldiers. Um, but at the same time, the British public overestimates those negative outcomes. So you've got the villain image present from the public assumption that, that soldiers would be more or as likely to serve a prison sentence, when in fact they're 30% less likely to go to prison. But we also see this image of the soldier as victim that's resonated with the British public through the overestimation of the risk of PTSD, as we've heard, the overall suicide rates, and homelessness. And the victim image, I think, has become more prevalent in recent years as a result of changes in British societal values, um, an increased recognition of psychological effects from war, but also the fact that the British Armed Forces, for a long time, through Iraq and Afghanistan, were fighting in unpopular wars. Armed Forces personnel, I've argued in the past, came to be seen as passive victims. And it was actually helpful to the public because it removed the responsibility or agency of those soldiers. And so it allowed the public to simultaneously support soldiers, but at the same time not support necessarily the wars which they were fighting. So it actually had a useful function in some ways. And what I'm interested in now, when I was writing about this um, between 2007 and, and, and 20, 2011, I was interested in whether this image would persist. Um, it was difficult to know whether this victim image was something that would rise and then would fall again. But I think what we've seen from this survey is actually that these images are persisting. It's not necessarily a dominant image. I do think the hero um, is probably still the most dominant image. But that, that, that idea about the soldier as victim is still there in popular culture and is influencing perceptions of the armed forces today. Thank you very much. Excellent. So you're up, trying to up your citation rate there? Absolutely. your papers? <laughs> Anything wrong with that, sir? Nothing wrong at all. We do it all the time. <laughs> right. So we now open it to discussion, questions, comments to the audience. So uh, in any no particular order, anybody like to kick off? And we have roving mics and uh, catch my roving eye. Where's, where's Brigadier Overton? You're, you're our Canadian military attaché. Would you like to comment, perhaps, uh, on what on the view from Canada? <laughs> need, need the mic? I know. He'll do fine. Thank you for the opportunity. He'll do fine. You're making me pay hello for me. I was actually very fascinated in terms of the, the rank ordering of the various professions and how the, your survey uh, came out with where they, they fell out because there's a couple of companies who've been tracking this in Canada for the last few years. And uh, I'm pleased to say that the, the view of soldiers is actually significantly higher in the rank ordering by that longitudinal study than you reflected in your study here. And it made me think a little bit about the methodology used and a little bit of background in terms of 5,000 is, is uh, 
is an interesting number when you're looking at five countries and considering the populations and perhaps you can talk about the methodology to where you've got where you're at and are you thinking about a follow-on on these results to take a look at it a bit more expanded way. Okay, so Bobby, you, you should defend your methodology. <laughs> Do you want to do them individually? Um, well, I'll start with you. Okay. So I think that's specifically, specifically for you, really, methodological question. Yeah. Have you still got the mic? Cause it's, were you, so th what's the difference in the rank order that you get in your study? Uh, we're pretty close to the top, actually. And so we've been there for the last three years. So I was really intrigued to see that in this independent study, it's uh, significantly different. Although still very positive, but uh, different in terms of the relative order. Sure, sure. Just to be clear on, on that aspect, the findings that I was showing there were for the UK, not for Canada. So we've, we've got the individual country results as well. So just, I'm just looking at that now, and, and you, you, are, you do well. You do well, in, in particularly in terms of uh, reference to the healthcare system, well ahead of the healthcare system, but you'd expect that compared to, uh, the, in contrast to the, the UK findings where the NHS is held in such high esteem. So I'm, I'm not sure that there is going to be that much distinction looking at the Canadian findings specifically here between yours, uh, uh, between what you're saying and, and uh, yours. Although soldiers do still come behind uh, fire brigade and, uh, and nurses on our list as well in Canada, which is interesting. But we can share notes on that. In terms of um, uh, reliability, um, a, thousand, uh, a thousand interviews in each of these countries of a general public sample where we're just looking at the aggregate is, is perfectly acceptable as a, as a decent indicator of opinion. So statistically, plus or minus 3% uh, if you assumed a, a simple random sample. It's not a simple random sample. It's a quota sample uh, based on an online population. So you, ne you need to bear those things in mind, but then the weighting tries to take out quite a lot of those uh, biases and differences in population characteristics. So no, we, we would stand behind a thousand as a good representation of um, the, the survey of uh, opinion in each of the countries. Okay. Oh, I see. No, no, sorry. Yes, no, it's a thousand in each of the countries. So it's 1,000 interviews in each of the countries. But as I say, we've got, we got the detailed findings for each of the individual countries, which are being released today and, and this week in, in the different countries a, a around uh, that we've covered in the survey. But very happy to share the individual Canadian results. Okay, I have checked the guest list, and the French military attaché isn't here, which is probably <laughs> fortunate. Um, I'd forgotten, of course, that. The, the data you were showing was for the UK, but you perhaps should summarise the French were remarkably different mm. to all, because I've seen the whole data set. Do you want to just summarise in what way? Because it was quite striking. So I think this, this, the, the big pattern in it is, uh, well, two, two big patterns. So <laughs> there is, in terms of people's estimation of the incidence of um, problems within or challenges within the, the military, uh, it's much more similar to the the public as a whole. So it's a much more of a normal distribution where the, the majority of people will say those issues are similar to the, the uh, population as a whole within uh, the armed forces. And I think it was, it was either Helen or Laura would say it's about the, the extent to which that's probably um, reflected in the fact that national service stopped much later there. So there's this sense of maybe less distance from the military in that sense, in terms of whether they're like the population or unlike the population as a whole, whether they're a special breed, uh, separate and apart. And then the second big thing is they're just more miserable about lots and <laughs> lots of things. And I, I kind of, it's not, it's not that the armed forces come out particularly badly uh, compared to other professions within the French data, it's just that they rate quite a lot of the professions a lot lower. And we, we see that, to be honest, we see that across a lot of our uh, perception data. When you're, whenever you're looking for a lack of optimism in a country <laughs> right now, it's always the French that are hanging off the bottom. So it, it's quite it's, it's interesting that that sense of lack of optimism, even even compared to Italy and Spain. So you're thinking more of the broader economic environment. Um, it's quite often it's very very hard to find optimism in in the French uh, survey data that we've got right now for, for all sorts of reasons. Do you, do you have an office in Greece? Yeah, <laughs> we do. Okay. Actually, yeah, oh, you yeah. do. Okay, yeah. Christopher. Mm. And, um, it's sort of a method point. Um, if these data uh, are interesting, which I think they are, for me a question, because the work I do, have done for British Armed Forces, for me what would be interesting is to go down a level and ask, um, what about gatekeepers, people of influence? Um, is it just replicated there uh, in terms of these data? 
because these people of influence gatekeepers have a major impact on uh, the climate of recruitment and above all the, rec the climate of, of resettlement and transition to civilian life. So for me what's interesting is, is to be able to go down a level comparatively to ask these questions which have a direct bearing on quite important personal policy issues from a, uh, from a defence point of view. Okay. Any, any new questions? Uh, Ahmed. Wait, you're going to need a mic in this particular theatre. There's, there's only one. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Simon. Sir Simon, rather. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Ahmed Hanker, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists Foundation Doctor of the Year. Um, just in relation to the tabloids, there was a uh, suicide bomber, Brit, aged just 17. So those who engage in radical activities report that military operations in Muslim-majority countries are what caused them to engage in those activities. So I was wondering uh, if there's any data on the survey from the uh, Muslim participants. And uh, I mean, I conducted a short survey myself, and the results have revealed that there's still a lot of work to be done. But there's also some optimistic results as well, so I just wanted to get some feedback on that, if that's okay. Okay. Who wants to pick that one up? And it sounds like starting with you again, though. Bobby. Yeah, so just stuck to that. You're a data man. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, not. I mean, it, as you okay. see from the population figures that we put up at the beginning, it's only five percent of the population within the UK, for example. So that's too small a proportion of the one thousand. So picking up on that point, very happy with a thousand as an aggregate sample, but being able to drill down into five percentage groups of the population, you just can't do reliably uh, with that sort of sample size, unfortunately. We'd love to, but it uh, can't push, push that data, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Any, any other issues coming up? Gentleman right at the back. I'm gonna keep the mic guys very fit today, I think. And just uh, introduce yourself, just so. Hi, T.S. Allen, I'm a United States Army officer and I'm here at King's right now doing a master's. Um, two separate questions for the panel um, that I'm really interested in. Um, there's a lot of data within the United States on um, both sort of American willingness to use force um, and of course also American casualty tolerance. Um, I'm not familiar with what the comparative data is for the other countries that are involved in your survey. Um, I know that in the United States some, some pretty good work has, has convincingly established that Americans are usually pretty hesitant about the use of force which I imagine has something to do with their perceptions of the military today. Um, and also that uh, American uh, sort of support for foreign military interventions goes down by about 3% every time casualties go up by a factor of 10, so long as we think that we're losing, which is the big binary. Um, so I'm wondering, um, when you look at this survey data, how does perception of the military increase, first of all, the willingness of the country to deploy force in the first place, and second of all, the willingness of people to allow those soldiers to continue to die in pursuit of their objectives? <laughs> So, Christopher, that's obviously a chance for you to increase your citation in this. Because you've written masses on this. I mean, within this survey, um, um, we can't say anything particular in response, in response okay, to your you question. You can on the basis of what you've written. But, but on the basis of, of, of you know, work that's been done um, before, I mean, one which has already been made, uh, certainly in the UK, it is possible to have very positive views of the armed forces, um, but not of the conflicts, armed conflicts in which they're engaged. If you like, love the troops, hate the war, kind of bumper sticker point, and I think that's found on both sides of the Atlantic, certainly Canada, US, uh, UK. On the, the vexed question of casualties, I mean, uh, reefer and fever and others, um, that, that s still seems to me um, state-of-the-art kind of argument, which is that there is no such thing as zero uh, tolerance of casualties. Much depends upon the nature of the conflict um, that's being sold, if you like, uh, um, by government, um, the rightness of the cause, its importance, and whether the costs in terms of blood sacrifices are worth the perceived <coughs> benefits, and particularly progress. And I think one of the great problems of, of, of use of force policy is, you know, it's the standard motorway question. I mean, kids in the back say, are we nearly there yet? And we're engaged in kinds of conflicts in which it's extremely difficult to um, make a very strong case for the casualties that are being suffered. I mean, that's, that's always, been, always been a problem. It's a political problem of selling it. <laughs> okay. 
we'll come back to that, I suspect. So we've heard from Canada, we've heard from the US, so we should hear a bit from the home team. Uh, General Gregory, you're the Chief of Defence uh, Personnel. Anything you heard that particularly surprises you? Um, yeah, Andrew Gregory, Chief of... Actually, I've changed my title, Simon. Chief oh. of Defence People, to be more oh, interested. <laughs> um, so, my, my job, I work in the Ministry of Defence, that uh, much-valued brand, and uh, my job is effectively the HR director. So I'm responsible for the people, policies and processes, particularly to attract and retain. So the difference between perception and reality is really important to me because what it does both for those people we'd like to join the armed forces, whether as regulars or reservists, and those people in the armed forces it changes their motivation. Uh, Christopher, you mentioned gatekeepers, and I might just come back to that in a minute because they're a really important audience. So the message we would like to get out, this is not a sort of advertisement, it's just telling you where we stand, is that we would like people to serve, and that gets us away from the hero, villain, victim. Mm -hmm. It's about valuing service, in our case, to Her Majesty and this country. It is about the fact that service is good for you, we will upskill you, and if you get damaged during that service, we will look after you, and if we discover that damage post-service, particularly in terms of some of the mental challenges that may materialise much after uh, people have left service, there is a mechanism to support you. Service, you will be better for it, and we will look after you if you get damaged during that service. So the challenge, and what I'd be really interested in hearing from, from the panel, is given, Bobby, you know, the difference that you have portrayed between the reality and the public perception, which affects people's uh, inclination to support sons, daughters, joining the armed forces, back to gatekeepers. I mean, you mentioned the specific challenges of Muslim communities and others where we have a real challenge in getting Muslims to join the armed forces. We currently have 600 out of 150,000 serving. Uh, I would like many more. I'm president of the Armed Forces Muslim Association. I'm intimately involved in this, and it's hugely difficult. How do we change um, the perceptions of the public gatekeepers and potential um, people who might thoroughly enjoy and benefit a career in the armed forces. I'd be fascinated for some of the audience. <laughs> okay. Because that will uh, solve one of my... That's very good, yes. So <laughs> Top that, challenges. So, you. Helen, you know, someone has held General Gregory's job with different names, obviously. They keep changing it all the time. I didn't know that for, for probably uh, hundreds of years, I suspect. Do you think they would always have made the kind of plea that the general has just made, or do you think this is something rather new? I think... That you weren't expecting that, were no, you? No, Oh, good. You, Off you go. You, you, you <laughs> yes, you completely fooled me because yeah. I have a completely different answer to, ah. to the general's question. Anyway, um, yes, from a, from a historical point of view, because I am really foremost, formally, formally, formally a historian, um, recruitment and retention have always been difficult. Easier during times of unemployment, but traditionally, yes, we've always had this problem. What I think is different is that victim image and the idea going away from the idea of service to, to an idea of service is going to damage you. And that's, that's what I think is so damaging today and that perhaps wasn't really there um, in the past in quite the same way. Um, in terms of the survey, although that's the point I was going to make, no, right. you, you, you might find that it, there was that some, actually some interesting results that, that haven't been presented here in that the public think that the, Br the British public think that the armed forces are generally more representative than they actually are. So they overestimate how many women are serving, they overestimate the percentage of ethnic minorities. Um, so there's, on the one hand, you've got this victim image and some negative interpretations around some issues. On the other hand, there's to not seem as, to be as different as actually in reality they are. So, so from your point of view, there's some positive messages as well as some challenges to be, to be um, addressed. Christopher? Uh, it's a, it's a, hardly a uh, novel or exciting point, but it's an important one. 
<coughs> which is, um, if you want to understand how public perceptions are, are shaped, one has to ask a question about the history of defence journalism since the end of the Cold War. History of defence? Journalism. Journalism, yeah. Ah. Mm. Uh, I mean, once upon a time, uh, you know, also we've got to ask, you know, how long will newspapers exist and so on. I mean, so the whole organisation of journalism with, with a defence bent on it is, 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 is an interesting question to ask. Um, if you don't get that um, knowledgeable media, then it's really, a, really, really an up, uphill, uphill battle. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that you get, uh, going back to either the positives or the negatives, you get iconic episodes which appear in the media, um, whether it's a drunk veteran or veteran hero who does something extraordinary on the motorway, and so on. And I think it's, it's very, I know, I know this sounds awfully media-ish to talk about narratives and so on, but it's very, very important to be, we've heard about rapid reaction forces, but you know, to be rapid reaction forces to deal with iconic episodes, both good and bad, is very tricky, and the agility of media and I don't just mean the Ministry of Defence and, and PR and so on, but the, the more sympathetic media, the need for agility in such a fast-moving environment, for good and for bad, is so important. And that, that is, as your defence personnel, sorry, defence people, that's kind of a, a, that's a budgetary question in the end. It's a budgetary question, it's a priority issue uh, about how much money is going to be spent on it and who's going to do it. I mean, I think that's... Managing the narrative is easy to say. I know it's a cliche, but it's a very important part of the business, so it seems to me. Okay. We only have, I think, one representative of the media who are only liked by 1% of the population. Um, but I can't see him. Is Ben Farmer here? Ben? Oh, no. Ben, Ben's gone abroad. Oh, he's gone, gone abroad. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's, hiding, so, hiding. he's so unpopular. <laughs> he's so unpopular. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's fled. Yeah. He's fled. I can he's gone looking for a fight. Okay. Gentlemen at the back. Can I just pick up at one point? Yeah. Just oh, okay, quickly. Quick, 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 just, very yeah. quick. Um, just, just that point about um, you do not shift these myth. You don't. Not, you don't. You don't myth bust with facts uh, with people. They, the point about uh, the reason why these myths exist and why these strong reactions happen is it's an emotional reaction. And, mm -hmm. and one of the one of the biggest things across all these misperception studies that people fall into is that the rapid response, which I agree. Is, is a rapid response of fact. It's not. It's about creating your own emotional responses that are more positive and, and counter those. And, and you can kind of see that around the service messages that come through strongly, maybe less so about the skills and the equipment beyond that. And it's, trying to, it's creating those stories and narratives as opposed to trying to cor mis uh, correct misperceptions, because that misdiagnoses the problem that people's views are based on facts when they're based on an emotional reaction. So um, there's uh, just, just to bear that in mind from wider perceptions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually, yeah. Gentlemen at the back. Hello, thank you very much. I'm actually a member of the media. Reporting for the Broadcasting Service Forces TV. All ah, right. Um, Welcome. I've been really fascinated by the results of this survey, particularly the over-representation of, of PTSD and that side of things. I just want to talk broadly about the media and, and the effect they've had over the last decade, 15 years, in the way they've portrayed um, the armed forces. They've been very focused on individuals, on heroic acts, uh, focused on charities helping our armed forces. Have they been over-sympathetic? Have they oversimplified the armed forces and what they do with this focus on individuals and calling everybody our boys, our heroes, and so forth? And has that led, do you think, to some of the figures we've seen in this survey? Okay. Anybody want to pick up on that? Laura, I know you've been slightly silent a little, but uh, not quite your question, but flourish. Yeah, I guess in, ter thinking about the, in terms of thinking about mental health and the sort of mislabeling potentially of, of all mental health symptoms in military personnel as being um, a sign of PTSD is something that's uh, potentially connected to the picture that's been represented in the media, but I, I suppose there's been more stories recently about um, common mental disorders and also about alcohol being more of a problem, and I think it's interesting that actually for all of the disorders they were perceived as being um, worse in the military compared to the general population, So, um, and the same for PTSD when we know actually it's the same, but 
I think often it's thought that people in the military won't be depressed or anxious and that it would only really be PTSD. So maybe things are changing slightly due to some of the um, things that have been published recently. So. Okay. Anybody else want to come in on that? Oh, do, just uh, very quick. I think like, the, the issue is it's, it's much broader, I guess, than the media as in newspapers and news programmes and, and because entertainment campaigns by support charities, campaigns by other groups, it, it all add to this, this perception. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't at all lay it all at the, the door of individual media outlets. And that's one of the points really of doing this study internationally, to look at it in very different media contexts. And what you see is a lot of consistency across those countries in those different contexts. And, and we see that across lots of misperceptions. Uh, the, the study that I was uh, referring to at the beginning, we're actually not that bad compared to other countries. Actually, Italy are massively ignorant of uh, lots of facts about, they, they come off worse in our index of ignorance um, across uh, <laughs> a, a whole range of issues, closely followed by the US. Um, and then you, you've got Sweden and Germany at the top as the most mm. rational and uh, uh, accurate on these types of things. And we, we do pretty well on that. So if it was a media effect and, um, and we have a view of our media as being uh, more uh, extreme on these types of things, then it's not showing through like that. I mean, is a much broader aspect of all of these different information sources that come to people, but then also how we remember and process information. It is that point about vivid anecdote sticks, regardless of whether that is vanishingly rare incidents. And that is the, that's the big challenge of this, of getting that balance right and the responsibility in the messages that you put out. Um, that's uh, the, the, the key issue. I love that. Index of ignorance. That's a great, great line. You know, the countries that do rather badly on that are also our favourite holiday destinations. I'm sure <laughs> there must be a link there. We've got questions over on the left. Lady with your hand up. Thank you, Jan Mikowski from RUCI. Um Correct me if I'm wrong and apologise, but, but most of your questions have been focused around regular armed forces personnel. Uh -huh. Obviously, in the UK, we've had this massive upswing lately that we're changing to the whole force concept. So... Have you taken that into account anywhere, or what do you think that would do to your survey results if you were to ask the public about, to think about defence in terms of regulars, reservists, contractors, and that whole sway? Or do you actually think it would make no difference because the public haven't quite got that grasp as of what that really means now? Okay, we, I think we have several representatives from the reserves here, but for quick, quick responses from the panel. Uh, we, we specified very clearly what we were talking about, and it didn't include reservists for the most part, I think, in, in, in the question. So uh, we, we needed to be really specific because we were comparing it to actual data, real data, so we needed to know that people were thinking about the same things. But to your second question, I don't think it would make a massive difference to people's responses because they don't have that nuanced or detailed a, a, a vision of what's the difference between regular and reservists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is um, Vince Connolly or John Crackett in the audience? In the, ah, yeah, there you are. Would you like to pick up on, on, on that? Next channel. Well, we do have some of our own. You data. just introduce. Oh, sorry, John yeah. Crackett. I'm Assistant Chief of Defence Staff, responsible for reserves and cadets. Um, so, very interested in, in, in data. Um, uh, and I understand it doesn't specifically identify the reservist angle. I, th I think the answer to the, to the, the lady from Reese's question is probably that actually the, the public do not separately make it, they don't perceive the subtlety of the whole force approach at the moment. Uh, we are, of course, are very interested in what the public perception of reservists is so that we can formulate policy in a way that might be sympathetic to creating an environment in which we can recruit and retain reservists more easily. So we do do a lot of our own research and, and, and um, uh, test the effect of, on our public relations and our other policies. And um, you know, without, without going into that in great detail, I mean, I can tell you that some of the things that we have been doing since the white paper and relationships with employers and making the reservists job more interesting and, and more worthwhile have, generally speaking, pushed up the, the public favourability in the UK of reserves by some 10 percentage points. Uh, how, how do you know own. that, John? Well, because we do we do a, a rolling uh, survey of the okay. public. Okay. It may be a competitor organisation. <laughs> 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 we don't mind. We don't. It, it is it is very important, and it's something we do. Okay. 
Um, I guess reserve it sort of fall in the middle, in between, and a lot of the surveys in between the general population and, and serving personnel. And in terms of surveys, they could be included, say for the mental health surveys, they could be in the military survey, but they could also be in the general population survey, and they wouldn't be identifying that as their main career. So it's quite interesting in terms of where how they could be represented in terms of the data. Okay. Now, well, it's strange, really, picking on what you, you said at the back, that clearly the public have a perception that uh, there's probably higher rates of mental disorder among veterans than, than there is. But you'd imagine that might be reflected in making it relatively easy for them to get help. But what we hear from the charities and from NHS reps are here as well, that that's not the case. David, you're the other chair of so Chief Executive of SAFO and the biggest charities. Yeah, I'm very interested in, in some of the media points. Um, okay. If I can just take you back there for a moment. Um, we deal with about 90,000 <laughs> yeah, individuals a year, um, individual cases of people um, serving... So, and, say and that again, how many a year? 90,000. 90,000. Right. Um, individuals. So we've got some interesting data and interesting statistics, and we see trends and the rest of it. When we talk to the media, they're not interested, <laughs> because it's not their narrative. When we say what you're saying... Um, in the media is actually incorrect, talking about victims, and the vast majority of people are not victims, they're just people with, with getting on with their lives with, with particular problems. Not interesting, because it's not the perception that they've got, or the, or the story they want to tell. The story that we're being told all the time by the newspapers, may be being supported by some charities, because it certainly helps them financially in fundraising terms, and there's a reality in that. Not, not the bigger British legions, but some of the smaller ones. What the story we're being told is that the British public don't understand. They only understand very simple things. They only understand what's, what, what's on, the, on the front page of the sun or the front page of the mirror. If you get onto page three of the Telegraph, it's all too difficult, all too complicated. And I suspect some of the things that you've been talking about and some of the things that you've found will be a bit too complicated for the British media. Um, and they'll pick out, they'll pick the bones out of the 69% of, of the British Armed Forces who were drunks, and that's how I put it. Um, they'll pick out the, the 50% of the, those who are currently serving the females who, who are equally um, culpable in their, in their drinking habits. They won't look underneath what are, what's really going on. And that's deeply worrying for us in the charitable sector about trying to get into the psyche of the British public where the need really is, trying to get in the psyche of the British public that the, the story being told them isn't the real story. And it's far more complicated than that. How do we get around the simplification of the British, of the British media? Over to you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, you're an expert on simple things like who's going to, who's go, well, how are you going to vote for so in the general cruel. election? That's a nice simple it's question. Cruel. I know, cruel, I know, I know. I enjoy that. Go on. Um, yeah, I mean, so. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Is, right. the, is, the, is, the, is the, the honest, right. the honest response? I mean, I think it, some, some other areas where these misperceptions abound and where people are trying to shift um, a, a media stroke uh, uh, public opinion narrative. Um, because I, 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 you have to say that there's an interaction there between those two things. They do, the media do not exist in a vacuum. They, they take cues and responses from what is popular among their readers and they, they come back to that. And people like vivid anecdotes and stories and, and they do like those, those simple aspects of it. But, but a parallel would be around immigration and uh, people's views of immigrants. And we've done a lot of work on how you, you shift the narrative around that for, for individual charities and, and other groups. And it, it is really tough. And uh, what you, particularly from a, a media engagement perspective, getting those positive stories out is one of the toughest things that you can do, even when they're quite compelling stories. And, and it's partly because it goes back to the social psychology of this. It's not just vivid anecdotes that people remember, it's people r retain negative information much better than they can retain positive information on, on these types of things. So uh, it's, a, it's a really tough thing, and if I, I wish I knew the answer of how you would do that, but there's definitely lessons and uh, points that you can learn from other contexts like that immigration debate okay. where they've actually managed to shift some elements of it. And a lot of it is breaking it down into individual elements and making sure that you're focusing on uh, the right effort, on the right bits that you can, you can move. Yeah, so, so you can see that a little bit in the immigration debate, because we have seen that. 
Um, and it's not to say that you can assign cause to particular actions that people have taken because the context shifts all the time, but you've, you, we have definitely measured, in our opinion data, a shift in the, the negative reactions to immigration and, and immigrants as individuals over the past year or so. It's, it's less, it's, it's not a particularly happy story in the sense that it tends to be more polarizing now where you've still got people with very entrenched views and then people saying, actually, we've heard enough about this. Uh, let's move on and uh, sort of talk about the positive aspects of immigration. So you're getting that polarisation in the population a bit more, but the, but the narrative has shifted for uh, significant proportions. Not all the population, but significant proportions of the population. Okay. Now I've got two things that I've got to s here. It says the end time is eight o'clock for reception, but in my running order it says twenty to eight. So we're going to compromise, compromise, <laughs> compromise, and come to a compromise. So we're going to finish at ten to eight. There's a nice compromise between. Good. Well, an interesting thing. These all the programs are completely different. So let's take three questions together now. So, gentlemen, right at the back in the corner, you've been very patient, and the lady on your right, and then on the left. Simon Strickland, uh, Cabinet Office. In your comments on emotionally numeracy, uh, you suggested, I think, that um, while the media entertainment, campaigning, etc., might play a role. What was important was how information was actually remembered. And my question, I suppose, is whether you can comment on the role of social media in, if you like, memory. Okay, social media and memory. And now the lady in slightly in the middle, there we are, just, or just bellow if you can. King's College. I was just wondering if your research touched at all on the effect. Can, can you use the mic more? Sorry, sorry I can't uh, hear. Erin at King's College London. I was just wondering if your research touched at all on the effect of perceptions or misperceptions on uh, issues surrounding commemoration and remembrance. Of, of issues surrounding, um, it's me, I can't hear, but say again. Commemoration and remembrance. Commemoration and remembrance, mm -hmm. okay. Right, okay. And then over on the left, just in front. Thank you. That's for you. That one. No, it's uh, just sorry, behind you there. Thank you. Sorry. Took my off the ball. If I can, oh, I'll Matthew again. Hello. trade on this and ask, actually do two questions. The first is for the group as a whole, and I'll use that to illustrate the point. So I do a very unscientific uh, study here. How many people have personal knowledge of a service member? Wow. That's really This good. is not a I typical like audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is King's College war studies, <laughs> and they score very low on the index of ignorance on these matters, but good try. <laughs> but it's interesting because I draw together a couple of threads. One is that we're talking about media. Media is a surrogate for actual knowledge, right? They're mm -hmm. providing you information on things you don't know. And the question was raised about what um, level of understanding is the individuals who are answering the, the survey actually have of the conditions which they're talking, personal experience of a soldier, okay. a sailor, airman, or woman, and, and how you think that could influence the study or where you would want to take the study to do that. The thing that intrigued me was that the comment was made, Bobby, by yourself. I think you thought that the footprint, no, in fact, there's one panel member who said the footprint of the armed um, forces in the United Kingdom is not very large. Um, we have half the size military force in a country that is 15 times your size. I would say we have a very small footprint in the community. You have actually quite a rich footprint and a large number of veterans <laughs> that supports that. So it's interesting how your perception of what you think the reality is is flavoring okay. your perception of what the results are. And well, a little bit of reality on that in terms of some of well, that, that was a, think that affects the results? That was a classic dodgy statistic though, wasn't it? You're 15 <laughs> times the size, but only, only in square miles, not in people. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right. So let's start with commemoration. This is you write on this a lot, so a chance for you to up your H index yet again. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, I, I looked actually at, and we can pass it, um, that phenomenon and how um, those who were killed were brought home and commemorated. Okay. Um, and that I think is interesting because that was an interesting site where people showed overt respect for those who'd lost their lives, but didn't necessarily, when they were interviewed by the media, agree with the, um, with the conflicts that were going on. So it was actually, a, it, it actually helped to highlight the fact that although people showed respect, they also had the image of these people coming back as victims. Some of the other work I've done revolves around the First World War and how the First World War has been commemorated so far up to 2015. 
And I think there, the overriding view of the First World War soldier now is one of a victim, well more so than, than soldiers now. But actually, there's an awful lot of linkage between the First World War and um, in, particularly in the media, but in museums and everywhere else, showing how the First World War was mismanaged, was futile, and how conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan were mismanaged and futile. And so by this linking, I argue, actually this victim image becomes amplified, both for the First World War and for the contemporary soldier now. So actually I think the commemoration is, 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 is fueling this, this image of the victim soldier. Oh, that's a very good point, actually, I agree with you. Christopher, yeah. memories. Um, one question to ask is, what would a survey of the kind that we've done look like, come up with in, in, in 10 years' time? Because one of the crucial questions that people ask, both in the business and just in the wider public, is, is will um, soldiers' sacrifices in an intense period of war um, non-stop. Will that recede? I mean, the charities are certainly worried about that. Um, There's it, lots of money around for the three or 4,000 charities for now, but all of them, on or off the record, will say five years' time, it look, looks a bit grim in terms of what other people do with their money. Not because uh, they haven't got any money, it's because uh, the sacred objects which, to which they wish to give money are maybe less sacred. And that connects to another point, uh, which, which uh, Helen mentions, is how will those wars be remembered in terms of, you know, was it worth it? Were the stakes being fought for worth fighting for? And did we succeed? And which leads to another point, that whatever war you talk about, including the wars to which I've just referred, as Brian Bond pointed out, uh, uh, emeritus of this parish, in his brilliant book, uh, The Unquiet Western Front, is in due course, we'll be having an archaeology of how things are remembered. Things come and go. I mean, the whole idea of the futility of the First World War is a very specific uh, 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 point in that archaeology and not the definitive one. I think we'll go through the same cycle again with the wars that have come to a conclusion and we're now engaged possibly <coughs> in another. And going back to the back, uh, uh, um, about uses of force. I mean, you know, public's, use, public's commitment to use of force, uh, both sides of the Atlantic, is one thing. But it's the kind of force being deployed. You know, this ghastly phrase, boots on the ground, is one thing. Uh, more remote forms of war for another. If you ask the public about the first, not the second, they get very different responses, I think. Anyway, so the memory point, I would suggest, is, is that uh, there is a concern in the charitable sector of, of forgotten heroes, victims. Uh, 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 in five or six or seven years. And who's to say they're wrong? We'll have to find out, won't we, with another survey. Okay. Quick comments on social media? Uh, yeah, I'll probably run that with the personal experience as well, so it's, it's right. sort of related, I think. Quickly. So, yeah, uh, so the, from a, a social media point of view, uh, we may be actually be able to look at that a little bit, because we've probably got some of those measures within the survey about how, how people are connected. My expectation is that you wouldn't see a massive effect in, in the sense that we did another event with Kings actually on the election and what, what affects people's views. And, and the, the clear thing from that is social media and traditional media are a system they're not disconnected, so actually one feeds the other and one lives off the other. So it's kind of, it is that in that sense, they both help create an agenda and the, the distinction in people's views between the relative views of those is, um, uh, is not as distinctive as you might expect. Um, and it's becoming so prevalent that it's, uh, it's not that a distinguishing factor. And then uh, the personal experience, what we didn't actually ask about, and I think it kind of ends on the sort of Chris, Chris point, is actually that would have been really fascinating to expand the study, look a bit more in detail about uh, views of gatekeepers, as, as Christopher has said, but then also views of people who've got direct connections and try to work out where these misperceptions come in, because I would expect that some, some of them exist in, in those groups as well. Okay. Denise, you straddle the world of King's Academia and Ipsos Mori and things like that. Do you want to have the last word? Well, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. Sorry, Good. You're not supposed to do that. I know. <laughs> um, I, I'm an army brat, so I was really interested from that pers perspective too. And one of the things that I think is fascinating is how these views change over time. So one of the things I'll be looking for is 
whether we can repeat this study, and in particular whether we can track it in relation to major events that happen. Because I think that we're getting much better in longitudinal survey research in linking to external activities, external events, and trying to look at the impact. So I would hope that we might do that at some point in the future. But uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Ipsos Mori in particular, because they do these surveys for us. Um, they would be enormously expensive if we had to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's a great advert. <laughs> 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 thank thank, thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah. right, that would be good value, though. Yeah. <laughs> Very good value. Especially good value in the way that we do. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we should finish. We, we do run, of course, a longitudinal survey of the health and well-being of the armed forces, and much of the data that we had today did come from that, that study that three of us have worked on for many, many years. So thank you all very much for coming. This is a, an audience extremely low on that uh, in index of ignorance, Absolutely. I think, it's a fair to say. Um, and now it's time to indulge in the favourite activity, which is we have food and drink next door. And can I thank the speakers, panels, and particularly Epsos Mori for hosting and indeed carrying out the survey. Well done. Yeah, that's the thing I can do.